Hi, everybody. This is Alex, and it's good to have you all back with us today. Um, and I hope you all had a good time chasing the comet. It's up there. We've been seeing a few pictures of it, and I hope you get out there and get your pictures. It's a nice dark moon weekend we just had. Um, we were out at Goat Mountain, and I got a few nice pictures. Not of the comet, though. I was doing some other stuff. But um, tonight, we've got a special show. Uh, it's about the ARP galaxies, and Gary M. is here to tell us all about some real kind of difficult-to-see objects. I know that because I too am engaged in, in hunting them down through the Astronomical League. Um, it's one of the things I do as a visual observer. And these things are really, really, really hard to find. Some of them are pretty easy. About 30 or 40 of them are, are uh, actually Messier objects or in the Herschel 400. But after that, it gets really dim and hard to see. But they make beautiful pictures because they're all peculiar. They're very peculiar. And uh, so I think you'll want to see some of these pictures that we're going to be showing you, okay? Um, but first, I have to make sure that you all understand that this is the Astro Imaging Channel, and the Astro Imaging Channel has lots of cool stuff that'll be happening on it. Oh, I did not do all the work that I'm supposed to do for this. The astroimagingchannel.org. I usually set this up beforehand, but we had so many people to set up. And Alex just made a mistake and cut himself off. Whoops. <laughs> well, uh, until he comes back on. Um, there he uh, is. What are our upcoming shows? He's, um, he's here, Molly, but Alex, okay, you're back. muted. Cool. Now, it says uh, when I start sharing on my screen, it'll be easier to explain. Remember, I said. Uh, be just before I check myself out, um, I said that I usually set this up beforehand, but we're presenting a number of people next week. And so we had more administrative work to do beforehand, and I never got around to doing all the work I was supposed to do. So when I went to show you the other things that I was going to show you, I went and clicked on this tab right here, which is the meeting tab that we're actually in the meeting with. And then I went ahead and went to search for the TAIC home so I could show you the calendar and all that stuff I usually do. Well, in doing that, I got out of the uh, Google Meets meeting. Yeah, I'm sure you're all interested in all those technical details, but honest, Gary's going to be here in his own peculiar picture showing us the peculiar galaxies and all that other stuff. Um, and then next week, we got something else that's kind of exciting. Uh, Larry Groom and I were out at the Texas Star, uh, at Okie Text Star Party last uh, October, early October, and we took a bunch of um, we took a bunch of uh, Apple iPhone videos of people and their imaging rigs. And we're going to show you them next week. Tim did a good job of kind of editing them down so that they weren't quite as long as, as they were when I first took them. And they sound a little bit better and some other things like that. And so we're going to be showing you five or six different rigs from the um, Okie Tech's Star Party next week. And uh, then we've got some electronic assisted astronomy, a couple of days, a couple of weeks off for um, the Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And then we've got a full program coming up for you. And we're pretty set all the way up until March. But as you know, in March, we're going to need some more people to come help and talk to us. And so hit the contact button. Look, you're all astro imagers. You're all smart people. You're all, you all know how to run a PowerPoint. You all got something you can share with the rest of us. And, um, you know, just do it. Just hit the contact. Tell us your first, your last name, and what you kind of like to talk about. It's not that hard to do. It's kind of fun to be in the room goofing around with us before the show starts. And uh, it really helps your fellow astro -im imagers. The, it, it's fun to you know walk around someplace and see people, hey, I've, I've seen that show. Thanks a lot. It really helped me out. It's a good feeling. So please take part in it. Um, I'm going to hold off on the rest of the explanations because I didn't set my computer up the way I should have before the show started. And I'm going to introduce, or I'm going to ask Gary Gary, you about ready to take over here? You bet, Alex. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing then. Gary, Great. tell us about these peculiar things you've been spending nights with, okay? Sure, thanks, Alex. I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up my presentation. First, I want to thank Tim Hutchison for asking me to give this talk uh, this evening, and 
I'm excited to talk uh, to the group out there about my project the last five years imaging the ARP galaxies from my backyard. So I'm going to bring up my, my presentation and um, Alex is going to tell me if this works since uh, I haven't done this before. And uh, let me see. Um, If I can bring up, um, Alex, can you see my screen now? With yeah, the first yeah, the there, yeah. You, your screen looks good, and okay. you, it looks like you're, it's running the way it's supposed to. And we've got a 15 to 30 second delay by the time it gets over to, uh, and there you are. And um, you're, yeah, over on YouTube, everything looks like it's wonderful. Just uh, go ahead and start your presentation. Great. So I'm going to I'm going to start here. Uh, I'm actually going to go very quickly through some of these introductory slides. Um, they have a lot of detail. Uh, this is uh, presentation is being recorded, and so I'm not may not cover everything. But if that's the case and you're interested in something, either ask a question, uh, or you can go back and look at the recorded version just to get more of the detail that I may have to kind of skip over given the, the time that we have. I will say this though: uh, you're encouraged to type in questions. Uh, to YouTube there uh, on your on your screen in front of you, uh, I will take those. Uh, Tim Tim will help me field those. I can't see them where I am at, but I will try to field them here as a, as the presentation proceeds. So as an introduction, I retired on 2014 from a career in engineering research project management. I think it does help to have uh, in this hobby. It does help to have a background in the sciences. Um, you know, for example, use of the scientific method to debug all of the myriad of problems that we we get with our, our scopes and our cameras. Uh, that's been very helpful to me. In 2015, we moved from Houston to our lake house in Onalaska, Texas here. I live an hour and a half north of Houston with my wife. My wife actually picked out the house and location. And the reason I say that is when people see uh, the images now and, and what I'm doing now, they assume that I had this grand plan in mind. Actually, my wife picked this spot, uh, which turns out to be a perfect spot to image. My, my son actually picked the hobby. So uh, it kind of all fell into my lap as a gift here, and I'm very thankful for that. I started a nice post-retirement life of mainly fishing, golfing, volunteer work, uh, visiting with the kids and grandkids. And then about a year after we started uh, enjoying my retirement life here at the lake, my son suggested I looked into astrophotography. And I think my words to him first were, why would anybody want to do that? Why? I want to see these objects with my own eyes. Why would I want to take pictures of them? That that's. Of course, I was I was just stupid. Uh, it's one nice thing about having children as they get older; they can uh, give you some good advice. And so uh, it's it's really changed my life here. And and as, as some of you know, who are my Astro Astrobin colleagues, uh, I have a real passion for this stuff. I learned the hobby from mainly from books and websites from people that maybe on the video call right now uh, and, and put up some very interesting uh, ideas like Alex, you know, just helping us out through these presentations, these channels. I have never uh, met an astrophotographer in my life face to face, um, but, you know, I've communicated obviously daily with, with people. And so if you're looking at this now and living in some remote area or if you're watching this video two years later and you're in some remote part of the world, uh, just know that you can you can learn this hobby. It's a wonderful hobby. If you're remote, that's probably even better since the light pollution is probably low where you are. A mentor. In the old days, we, my sense is, of course, I wasn't around. Uh, I didn't do this very long, but uh, I, my sense is that people needed mentors and needed people to help them through the process. Of course, that's a lot easier to have, but you can also learn this hobby individually. I've currently posted about 1,500 different images on Astrobin. That amounts to about 8,000 hours of imaging time, which in the five years I've been doing this is about 40% of the total astronomical darkness here. So I've been fortunate here. I get a lot of clear skies, and I'm going to talk about that next. Uh, before I move on, though, um, and let me bring up my little uh, laser pointer here so you can see my mouse hopefully uh, a bit better. Uh, up in the right-hand corner, I'm just going to have a scattering of my images uh, just to give you a feel. I'm not going to talk to them really uh, as we go along. But if you get bored with what I'm saying, you can at least enjoy the, the pictures. And it just gives you a feel for what these ARP images look like. And uh, this is ARP 142, which is uh, nicknamed the penguin and the egg for obvious uh, reasons. So um, as some of you know, I live in Ivan, Alaska, Texas, and I live on the second largest lake in Texas at the place of the X 
shown here. And I have about eight miles of water to the south. So I live on the end of this peninsula. Um, of course, one of the best fishing lakes in the world for white bass and, and catfish. Um, but there's five aspects of this location. And to the right here, you can see the, the level pad that I built uh, next to my house and the, and the view to the south. And there's five aspects of any location that need to be considered for astrophotography. One is the declination. Where do I live? I'm at plus 31 degrees north. And you'll see why that's important uh, here in a few minutes as we talk about the location of the Palomar telescope, which is where all of the ARP images were taken. Number two thing is obstructions. Obviously, being on the water, I have no obstructions. I've imaged objects down to six degrees above the horizon. Uh, probably not the clearest image in the world at that point, but still, uh, it's fun to be able to capture these images. At that point, they're about minus 50 south. So uh, I can go down to about minus 35 south. And of course, uh, the ARP objects actually go that far. So you need to have that capability to go south. Light pollution, I'm at a Bortle 4.5, which is OK. That's probably probably better than a lot of you who live in the suburbs in a city. It's not, not as good as, as being at a dark sky side, but it's not bad. And I think one of the things that really helps me here in trying to image these tiny objects that are so far away is the scene. And I haven't really had a way to, to quantify this at all. But when I have a south wind and it's coming over eight miles of water, I, I'm assuming here I'm getting a pretty laminar flow. I don't have any of the buildings, trees, warm land. And so um, I think my scene is actually pretty good. And for that reason, you look at if you look at the image scales of the setups that I'm using, my camera plus the scope, I'm really violating some of the rules here on uh, what your image scale should be. And I think that's because my scene is actually pretty good. And then finally, clouds. I live in a place here north of the Gulf of Mexico, south of uh, where the jet streams are normally traveling. So I think regionally, the, there's usually a, a, a good skies at night. And then locally as well, having this huge lake, the lake actually creates its own weather to some extent. So for example, this picture I took, uh, my son actually took this a few months ago during the summer. And this is pretty typical where you can see we live here at the X and you can see clouds all over East Texas, except over the lake. And what happens is the hot air rises during the day. As that hot air is rising, it's sucking moisture out of the center of the lake. And oftentimes, we'll have clear skies over the lake while clouds are all around. So living on the peninsula, basically in the middle of the lake, uh, helps out uh, to that extent. So this is my setup. I am not blessed, as some of you are, with uh, an observatory. I would love to have one. I live in a neighborhood which has uh, some, some laws that prohibit that. So I typically have to set up and take down each night. And this is, as most of you know, a couple hundred pounds of equipment. So it is uh, it is a bit of a chore, but I've kind of grown to embrace it and enjoy it. And you can do things to make yourself you know, much more efficient when you're trying to set up and take down every night. You can see the windscreens that I've designed here using mesh and PVC pipe. Uh, they go into tubes that are into the ground. Uh, of course, I put that up and take that down each night. It takes about five minutes. On Astrobin, which is where all of my images are posted, you can see a description of that setup and how that's done if you're interested. Uh, dew heaters here are necessary. Oftentimes, our humidities are 99%. And so even though some of these cameras, like a good example is the 62, ASI ZWO 6200, it has a heater embedded into the sensor unit, um, that that's still with the humidity I have, still I still have problems with that. So I always uh, need to use dew heaters to keep uh, all of that moisture uh, from fogging up uh, the lens and frosting over the lens. Once I get this set up, I can control the unit from my house through Cat5 cable and through Windows Remote Desktop. And this has been a lifesaver for me. I used to have to, every couple hours, I would get up and go out and, and change the setup or tweak the setup or move things around. Obviously, now, if I want to actually physically change something, I still have to go out there, but I can do any kind of the retargeting, the refocusing, all of that from inside the house. And that's been a real, real convenience. And that's how this worked flawlessly. I try to, as I mentioned before, I try to mention uh, image every minute of clear sky from, from dusk to dawn. I'm retired. I can do that. And my wife's very understanding. And so that's one of the, the, the best pieces of gear you can have as an astrophotographer is have a spouse that's uh, understanding a spouse. 
The scopes that I use primarily, I've got a number of different scopes. So the ones I use for the ARP images um, lately, anyway, the, the, towards the tail end, primarily the five inch Takahashi, which I absolutely love. It's just a joy to image with that refractor. It's a TOA 130, a thousand uh, millimeter focal length. And then most of them have been taken with my larger scope, which is an SCT. It's an 11 inch edge HD, which is 2,800 millimeter focal length, the F10. And that presents a problem. Having a focal length that long uh, is an issue with respect to needing to have good scene, needing to make sure your focusing is spot on. Uh, it, it's, it's a real issue, you know, trying to image these very small objects. Now you might think that the difference between these two setups, the five inch and 11 inch, especially if you look at the diameter squared and the amount of total optical area you have in the glass, you might think that that's a big difference. Um, but when you do side-by-side -side comparisons, as I show here, uh, really the difference isn't as much as you might think. Obviously the 11 inch is a little bit clearer, it's a little bit less noise, the details are a little bit better. But if all you have is, I say all you have, it's still a very nice piece of equipment, but if all you have is a, is a larger refractor, 130 millimeter refractor, you can still capture many, many of these objects very, very well. So, um, this comparison, I'm not going to go through this here, but basically I tried to have a comparison where the scene was about the same uh, on that night uh, and um, tried to keep everything as, as equal as I could. And you can see the 11 inch is, is better, but not, uh, not night and day better. Here's some of the other details before I start showing you the ARP images. My mount is a Mach 1 GTO mount. I have disabled the, the uh, correction on, on it. Um, simply uh, because I just haven't found that that makes that much difference when I'm guiding. Um, and plus then I don't have to worry about resetting uh, the, the, the worm gear and then resetting the scope uh, if I have to move that for some reason, in which case I'd have to take the PEC all over again. I, I think the focusers, automatic focusers are a must for these uh, because you have to focus you know, all the time. When I, before I bought my automatic focuser, focusing was a real chore and a, a real challenge. Guiding through off-axis guiding uh, again because of the long focal length, I needed to get away from having um, just a separate guide scope. Scope and actually that transition from from going from a using a guide scope to using an off-axis guider has been painless and really wonderful, and I can't say enough about about that. Uh, filters here um, just depends on the size. So in a smaller uh, five inch, I have the uh, Astrodon. And then uh, for my cameras, smaller cameras, I have the Astrodon. For the larger cameras, like the 6200, I have the chroma filters. And then I'm, I'm not a fan of reducers at all. Um, the only, in my opinion, the only time you use these reducers is if, is if you need to increase the field of view. But because we're typically we're imaging such small objects, we don't really need uh, to use a reducer to increase our field of view. When it, and I've done many comparisons with all of my scopes between reducers and not reducers. And reducers don't have that much of an impact, but they, in my opinion, they do make the stars uh, a little funnier and, and the objects, you know, maybe not quite as crisp. But that's, a, you know, that's just a personal preference I have. This shows you the cameras I've used. Um, of course, it's been a journey. It's been a five-year journey, and, and the camera technology, the CMOS camera technology, has come a long ways in, in the time uh, that I've started uh, doing this art project. So you can see the number of images I've had with each of the combos. Um, I actually took quite a few in initially with my 130, with the 1600, which many of you are familiar with the 1600 camera. It's a real workhorse camera. But you can see by far the most images I've taken is with my C11 paired with my 294. And you might ask, well, why don't you use the 1600 with the C11? 1600 is a, a much a full frame sensor, much bigger sensor, less dark noise, uh, much more expensive camera. But when I compare results between those two cameras, the 1600 and the 294, I'm happier uh, with the detail on the 294. And I have posted some of these on Astrobin. I would say the 294 is a bit more difficult to calibrate and process, but uh, at the end, um, all I'm really interested in is the final quality of the image. And I think I, and, and of course, the other thing to say there is when you're processing so many images, having that full frame sensor, that, that is a lot of processing and it takes a lot of time. So um, the smaller sensor size of the 294 actually you know, kind of helps in that respect. Now I've talked about seeing an image scale and the typical recommendation, and I've taken this chart off of one of the vendor's sites, but you can see that typically the recommendation is to stay between one and two arc pixels, arc seconds per pixel. 
And that's actually a you know good recommendation for the the typical uh, user, and I think that's a reasonable one. And I tried to kind of stick with that one when I started at about 0.8. But as I had longer focal length scopes and smaller pixels, um, I ended up pushing that downward. Now I'm imaging at 0.34, and that's kind of a ridiculously low image scale. But when I compare um, the different binnings and, and looking at the different image scales, uh, I do think I can get more detail at those low image scales and that my scene does allow that. And I know that's a bit of a controversial thing, but uh, you know, I've done the experiments and I'm just confident in my own mind that having those low, that low image scale helps me uh, in my cause. You'll see that the 294 has been too, actually without binning, that image scale is even at 0.17, but that's, you know, that's kind of a ridiculously low. low. And so, I, so at least, at least I've been too to get up to 0.34 there. Uh, software, and I don't think any of this is a surprise to most of you that image uh, using the Polar Mas Pole Master for polar alignment, uh, SGP for imaging, uh, PH2 for multi-star guiding. And then I do use a, a free uh, CDC Sky Atlas program for, for pointing the telescope. I only polar align at the beginning of the evening. My polar alignment does get a bit off as the evening progresses, but I haven't found that makes a huge difference. I have to focus at least once an hour. Uh, obviously, the temperature at these long focal lengths has a big impact, and you have to be crisp on your focus for these small objects. Um, typically, I want to be around 0.3 uh, RMS arc seconds on the performance of PHD2 with this scope. If I get much above 0.6, um, it's gonna to be too blurry and I'm not gonna be happy with the results. So like I say down here at the bottom, if my guiding performance is poor, I just put that telescope away and I bring out one of my shorter length scopes and I switch the nebula or something else here. It's not, you know, you have to do your ARP objects on really good seeing nights. And one thing I'll mention about the windscreen, so this just shows you there was one night recently when the wind changed direction, which often happens during the middle of the night from south to north or vice versa. And so you can see as soon as it switched, um, I was getting some very poor, poor, poor performance, as you can see on the left side of this chart. And then in the middle here, I went outside and set up the windscreens, and then you can see the results after that. So those screens, um, when you're trying to image these tiny objects, th th those make a big difference in trying to improve the image quality. So finally, saying a few things about the imaging process itself. Um, as some of you know, I just have a standard time. I, my, my mantra here is to try to keep things consistent and regular and reliable. Uh, and so um, I use the, kind of the same unity gain, um, and I use the same time here, which is two hours for the loom and one each for the color. If I'm going to image something like a dark nebula or a planetary nebula or narrow band, things will change. But for these ARP objects, which are typically always LRGB, I typically try to use that five hours. I've experimented with different lengths of time, you know, two hours, five hours, 10 hours, 20 hours. But you know, five hours is a nice sweet spot for me anymore. And I don't think the quality improves that much. And of course, um, I wouldn't be able to take as many images. I'm trying to get 338 images for this ARP catalog, and uh, you, you can't afford to spend you know, 40 hours on each image by doing that. A couple of notes about the moon. So um, I'm a big fan of imaging during the full moon, uh, but that's got to be narrow band or a long ways away. I, I can't do any ARP imaging around the full moon itself. I, uh, on, on, I, I take the loom subs, which are the most important for detail, on the best seeing nights when I have less than half of a moon phase. And even at that, I try to stay at least 30, 30 degrees away from the moon. I try to take our RGB on the same night if possible to keep the stars a similar shape. And that's even true with the loom. Ideally, you, could, you should take loom and, and RGB if you can get those five hours all in the same night, because that way, uh, even if you have a slightly oval shape to your stars, you can apply some correction to that. If you've got different shapes for each channel, it makes that very, very difficult. And of course, with the RGB, I can image you know, with more moon. I'm saying here about up to 75% moon, but I still like to say 30 degrees away. If I get closer than that, um, the problem really is with my calibration. Things don't calibrate out as well when I when I start getting too much moonlight in the, in the frame. I typically don't image more than two and a half hours away from uh, Meridian. And even less if I'm really low. So if I'm less than 40 degrees above the horizon, um, I have to stay within what, about one hour of the Meridian each way. So for targeting, uh, I do, I'm pretty passionate about 
trying to optimize every minute I have. And so I want to go into the night with a plan and a backup plan and a backup plan to that. So I use Astro Planner. It's uh, kind of reminds me of software from the nineties. Uh, so it's not, uh, you know, it's not the state of the art, but it does everything I want it to do. It's not that expensive. You input the targets yourself. Generally, you can download some pre uh, supplied lists. I obtain my targets from different websites, magazines, papers, DSO catalogs. Of course, for the ARP catalog, that's easy. It's just all ARP, but uh, I do a lot more than just ARP. And so I try to obtain targets from all those different sources and from blindly looking through the sky atlases. So this screen shows you 20 minutes of time. Uh, this night, it went from 8.50 to um, 9.10. You can see I'm using what, what I call military time, 24-hour time here, because there's been too many times I'd be, you know, be 2 in the morning, and I'd set my alarm for four o'clock and I'd accidentally set 4 p.m. and I'd miss an hour or two of my sky. So everything's military time right now. And then what's nice about Astro Planner is you can color code uh, through these highlights. There's a highlight scheme here at the top and you can color code these objects. So the way I, this is just my default way of, of doing it. Uh, there's nothing magic about it. But the objects I want to get for that night are in blue. And you can see that's where I have a one in this column at the top, which is H. Um, and some of you may not be able to read this. Uh, but anyway, that's my, my C11 setup. I have a priority column for each of the setups. If I have a different setup, it'll show different objects that are priority for that setup. So the blue ones are the priority objects. The brown ones are the ones I've already imaged. And I really am not interested in doing anything again. Now, someday I'll go back and image, re-image some targets. But right now, I just want to image all different kinds of new targets. That's one of my passions. Orange is showing for this night, which is about 76% moon. Uh, it's showing objects that are too close to the moon. For example, this one here, NGC 38 is seven degrees away. That's just way too close uh, for that night. So orange is, I can just kind of discard those when I'm looking for targets. And then green shows you ones that are low declination, which I've defined here as less than uh, 30 degrees, I believe, minus 30 uh, from my location, minus 30 degrees, 30 degrees south. So those are tougher too. So I need good scene on those nights. So generally with this kind of color scheme, you can just pick out the blue targets and go with that. If you got clouds in one direction, then you can sort it by declination and pick ones that might be more towards the North Pole and the South Pole, for example. So it's very convenient to have a system like this um, to sort through targets ahead of time. In processing, of course, processing is a huge part of this. Um, uh, I'm just so thankful for all of the tools that we have. I use three programs mainly for processing as uh, they're not anything new here. Pix Insight is what I use most. And you can see the steps I use there for reviewing the subs, even though I like to grade them in SGP because I just think that's a quicker, quicker way than using subframe selector. But I haven't used subframe selector in the last year, so maybe that's improved. Um, I do, of course, do calibration, develop the masters, uh, deconvolution, noise reduction, stretching. And then I use uh, Adobe Lightroom as another kind of added step. A Lightroom, if you haven't seen it, came out within the last few months on, on just on the most amazing set of masking tools you could ever ask for, creating quick masks on the fly based on luminance. Based, it's just a it's just an amazing program. So if I want to make some detailed adjustments there to, you know, for example, add a bit more color just to the stars, uh, you can create those masks so quickly and uh, do that a lot easier than you could in PixInsight. And then, of course, organization Lightroom is built for organizing your photos. So when I've got 1,500 images, I want to have them organized well, and that does a good job of that. And then finally, Photoshop. I use that for a number of things, primarily the layer blending. If I'm, for example, for narrowband, want to combine my RGB stars with the, the nebula, um, I use that. I don't use that much for the ARP objects. I do want to come back here, though, and, and give a little hint out here. Uh, if, if you are... If, if, you're, if you're fortunate enough to have a backlog of objects, I know some of you aren't, um, but if you are fortunate enough to have a backlog of objects, it's good to complete your processing to this step as soon as possible after you image. I try to do it the next morning if I can. Because if you've got those masters developed and you know everything looks good, you can process those anytime. But oftentimes when I process those masters, even though the night seemed good and to me seemed like I was having a good night, um, Sometimes um, I'll get oval stars, I'll get streaks, I'll have to retake uh, the color images or a certain channel, something will happen, a cloud bank will go over. Sometimes too, I'll have a piece of dust or dirt that comes into my train. I typically don't like to retake my flats or darks for months at a time, but if something does happen, you know, and, and the reason I can do that is because I don't 
open up the train. I don't mess with it at all. I'm not switching the camera out. I'm just keeping things tight and solid and not letting dust in there. But sometimes some dust moves around. Well, then I have to re retake the flat, which is not a big deal. But if that happens, you know, a few months after you've done it, it, it may be too late. And, then, you know, you may have a different dust pattern at that point. So I found that it makes my life a lot easier if I can if I can um, do those masters as soon as possible. So I'm going to switch gears now and then start talking about the ARP catalog. Uh, just a little bit of background for those of you that may not know it. Uh, Dr. Halton ARP was... Uh, just such an interesting character, had so many interesting beliefs. Uh, he was a critic of the Big Bang Theory. He is a critic of their standard redshift model. And uh, if you haven't read up on some of his theories and his life, it's worth a read because uh, he, he does, he was, he was a brilliant uh, man. And uh, uh, not that I agree with all of the things he came up with, but he certainly was a visionary. And in particular, his work with peculiar galaxies, as Alex alluded to, uh, is pretty amazing. And so he worked at, at Palomar Observatory uh, for 30 years, and um, he was the driving force be be behind developing this ARP atlas, which we're going to study here in a minute. So he created this ARP catalog using the largest telescope in the world uh, at the time, and it was the largest telescope in the world for 30 years, a 200-inch reflecting telescope. And if you look at the telescope here at the lower right, it's just a you know, little a person could be standing down here at the bottom and you would hardly see them. So this is a monstrous telescope and uh, at the Palomar Observatory. And it, it's at a declination of plus 33 degrees. If you remember, my setup is at plus 31 degrees. And that's just it's just a fortuitous thing. And, and we'll talk about that in a second. The, the telescope was completed in 1949. So let's talk about this Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, because this is a, this is a landmark piece of, of work. And for those of you, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, it's, it's worth uh, looking it up uh, and, and doing some reading about it. So Edwin Hubble in 1936 published a landmark galaxy work called Realm of the Nebula, which were the galaxies. And what was interesting is he suggested at that time that peculiar galaxies could just be neglected. Uh, in view of their limited numbers. So at the time, uh, they were recognized that something like that was out there, but didn't generate a lot of interest. And it was, wasn't was until the 50s that the first pioneering work on these peculiar galaxies were, was done by Dr. Zwicky and then by Dr. Vronsa Velominov in the 1950s. Dr. Arp took a really keen interest and passion in these galaxies and began compiling and imaging photographs of them, including uh, some of Zwicky and, and Baranza Valminov's Bel work. Yeah, and he started this in 1962, the year I was born. And you know, people like Zwicky recognized his passion and would send him and forward him objects for him to add to his database. And so this was a, you know, kind of a joint work that Arp, Arp led. And finally, it took him four years, but he published the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies in 1966. And for me, this, this catalog was love at first sight because I had seen prior to this all these beautiful pictures of M31 and these beautiful disk galaxies that, frankly, they look fantastic and marvelous. And then, But here was a set of objects. It was like watching Jimi Hendrix play guitar for the first time. It was like... Uh, I don't even understand what this is. Uh, and, and some of these galaxies were so intriguing and so fascinating. So for me, it was love at first sight. And, and to think that years later, I could actually try to take pictures of these from my own backyard <laughs> with my telescope. And it still kind of, kind of blows me away. So a few quotes uh, from his preface to the Atlas, which I found interesting. So this is a quote from him. 40 years after the discovery that galaxies are independent systems, we still have not penetrated far into the mystery of how they maintain themselves or what forces are responsible for shaping their forms. And then this one here, the Hubble classification, which was the, the first uh, recognized popular classification, divides the galaxies into the well-known categories of smooth ellipticals and flattened spirals. But not all galaxies fit this idealization. And, and this is kind of a famous quote from Dr. Arp. In fact, when looked at closely enough, Every galaxy is peculiar. Now, I just absolutely love that, that quote. And then finally, he says, it is hoped that this investigative procedure will not only clarify the workings of the galaxies themselves, but reveal the processes and how they operate and furnish a better understanding. And what's really unique about the way he approached this, it, it, it was a way of doing science 
by simply looking at categories and looking at pictures. It wasn't necessarily digging into theory and coming up with a lot of what some people would consider important stuff. It was, you know, looking at these images and trying to figure out what they were. And uh, for that reason, it's very interesting for us now today to use our equipment to try to compare back to the images that Dr. Arp took. Later, 30 years later, he did write a book called Scene Ready. He wrote many books, but in this one, um, this, this one kind of blows me away as well. So this quote from Scene Red is where Dr. Arp says, for me, the whole lesson of the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies are that galaxies are generally ejected material. And that's quite an amazing quote. And I want to come back to that towards the end as we look at some of the pictures of these galaxies. So before I continue, Alex um, and Tim, um, am I still coming through OK? Uh, I'm not getting, it's hard. We don't have any visual feedback here on my end. So are, are no, things still You're, you're okay? doing fine, Gary. Okay. Uh, hey, Gary, you. Gary, before we go on, is this a good time to clear out the question bin? Sure, sure. Okay, Eric, have you uh, been studying the questions? You got some of the. Uh... Yeah, there was a. There's been a discussion. I made a few comments about the when you register the 130 image to the to the uh, 11 inch image, how one is a bit noisier. And I found that when you zoom too much on an image, it gets less definition. But when you compared those two images, the galaxy itself looked comparable, but there was some more noise in the background of the registered and supposedly enlarged 130 image. Yeah, that's a that's a good that's a good point. And part of that's due to the image scale of both of those systems. So you know I, I kind of did the best job I could of doing apples to apples, but it, it could be that that comparison um, you know was not perfect, but but I, I, I did feel like it was consistent. In other words, um, uh, looking at the background noise in particular, because I'm I'm really uh, there's we're we're all sensitive to different different things, and the two things I'm really sensitive to are the star quality and the background noise. And so you know I did try to pay some attention to the noise, but but I think you, know, you have to be careful with those kind of comparisons. And I think that's why it's so important that you don't necessarily believe everything you read or see, and just do the comparison yourself because there's so many different variables. It's uh, I'm not going to claim that I got all of that right necessarily. Now, are you doing registration with PixInsight or some other? Yes, all, yeah, all is, PixInsight does such a fantastic job with registration. It's all through PixInsight, yeah. Uh, there was another question here. Do you find the stars are the same size between the luminosity and the RGB? And size, they're probably referring to full width half max. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, um, I definitely, you know, the, the, the loom is always, you know, so much bigger and... Um, and that's a hard thing to manage, really, a uh, star size. Uh, you know, and, and there's tools in PixInsight to do that, you know, with MT, whatever that tool is, some of you know what I'm talking about. But it, it's, it's a hard thing. And that's probably what bothers me most about imaging with a 2800 uh, millimeter. When I go back to my TAC, uh, the stars just look so much better. And so if some of my images, I mean, I'm not exaggerating here. This, and some of you will attest to this. The stars sometimes are bigger than the galaxies that I'm imaging. And that's something I hate, you know, but uh, but that's just the way it is. Now, maybe I should be taking, um, you know, shorter looms uh, or, you know, different gains. I, I don't know. I haven't really tweaked that much, but definitely my, my, my loom stars are bigger than my RGB stars, no doubt. So did you say that you take your luminosity images the same period as your RGB? Yeah, two minutes, yeah. And do you process them uh, both the same way? <laughs> No, no. I when I stretch them, I find that, um, and, you know, we're all. I guess it's a, we're all different in that way. Uh, I stretch the loom stars just with HT, which is just a typical, you know, stretching function. But I use the arc sign way of of stretching for at least, you know, I would say half of what needs to be done. So at least the first half of the stretching process for for the RGB images, I use the arc sign because I think that maintains. And then I do the rest of it with HT, but. Uh, I have a, I, I want to make sure I maintain the color because if I just stretch them both with a standard process, uh, in particular the RGB, I lose a lot of the color that I really enjoy in those stars. So I end up using that arc sign process more. Uh, we had that same discussion last week, and uh, I think we have a few proponents of the arc sign, yeah. even though I think there was some discussion about how we're mispronouncing it 
I think that <laughs> came from Molly. But uh, we're sticking to the arc sign pronunciation. Okay. Right um, we Alex? Have, yeah, we have a question from Uwe Dortmund, and he's asking, uh, Gary, are you imaging right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Uwe, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It's good to hear from you. Um, uh, we, we we had a little family get together, and one of the trivial names was if you could change your first name to anything, what would it be? And mine was Uve. Um, so uh, it pains me to say I'm not imaging right now. <laughs> no, I, and that's only because it's it's a too cloudy and b too windy. But you know, sometimes sometimes I actually appreciate. And well, my wife won't agree with this. But sometimes I actually appreciate having cloudy and windy skies because. It is a grind, you know. It's a grind to go, and I'm not. You, you guys will kill me because I'm whining about something I shouldn't be whining about. But you know, to go night after night, all night imaging, even though I'm getting, uh, you know, some naps in between. And I, I said on my slide before, but I didn't address this. I have tried uh, automatic sequencing, and I've had some luck with that. But I'm so adamant about trying to get my focus right and trying to get my framing right and so on for these small objects that it just pains me if I get up the next morning and I find out that I didn't get the image I wanted. So, so I do end up in sleeping in like, you know, two hour increments basically through the night. And that, you know, after a number of nights in a row, that's kind of draining. So, so it is nice to have, Uwe, it's nice to have a few nights uh, off once in a while. Uh, um, Gary, I, we can say for sure that this is an addiction. So, and we all have it. Um, Gary, uh, have you tried a scope buggy? You know, uh, a scope, tri put your tripod on a, on wheels. And yeah, and you know, what's, what's funny about that is I built myself uh, a scope buddy, which was absolutely perfect. You know, I'm an engineer, so I can do that. And it had wheels and it lifted it up. And, and eventually I just decided instead of that, I'm just going to work out every other day. <laughs> and actually, actually now it's, it's a piece of cake. You know, once you get used to something night after night after night, um, you know, it's not so bad. So that, that part of it's not the problem. It's the, it's just the time. Like the other night I got set up, it was running and after an hour it clouded over and it's just, you know, it's just discouraging sometimes that way. Yeah. Okay. And that 11 inch is a pretty good lift. Yeah, I looked at the 14. I really wanted to get the 14, but um, as I get older, I think that would be even tougher. What's what's your windscreen made out of? Uh, Chandra Sekar Nori wants to know. Yeah, it's a it's a black mesh material that is best obtained off of Amazon, and you can get it in uh, very very um, standard, uh, like like say 10 by 5 foot uh, lengths. And it's nice because they like these grommets every few feet. And um, if you look at the way uh, I designed it on Astrobin, you can use those grommets to zip tie. I use zip ties all the time. I'm, I probably have spent more money on zip ties than anything else here. And um, it just works out really well. I sink a slightly larger PVC pipe in the ground as a sleeve, and then I slide that pole in, and I drill holes through the PVC that's standing vertical so I can put the zip tie through, and then I put it through the grommet and cinch it tight. And once I do that, you know, that thing lasts for years. I have never replaced those mesh. It's just plastic mesh. The only thing that you have to worry about is uh, here in Texas where it gets so humid, I sometimes have to let them dry out because I, they've never gotten moldy, but I'm kind of worried if I put them away wet, that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Shonda Seker continued his question and, and now uh, Solution Seeker really wants to know uh, what um, wind speeds can you image in with oh. that thing? <laughs> That's a... That is a great question. So, uh, so, did, <laughs> so if the wind is from the north, it's about seven to eight miles an hour. If the wind is from the south, it's about twelve to thirteen miles an hour. And 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 that's an interesting thing to say. But uh, the north side, I've got buildings, I've got trees. So I'm not really sure why it's different. I'm assuming it's because from the south, it's a much, like I said before, it's a much more laminar flow. You mean that's, that's how much it can handle? It, if, if, if it's more than 12 miles an hour, you're not going to put it out that day? Oh, no, those windscreens will handle even out to 30 miles an hour. It's not the handling. It's that even with those windscreens, it, so there's, there's, in my opinion, there's, there's multiple aspects that cause problems when it's windy. One is just the local, your scope being buffeted by the winds, and that's what those windscreens are handling. But you also have this huge column of air that's going up for miles above your scope. And so 
when it's too windy, my scope is still not moving because I've got the windscreen, but it's the air above it that's causing the problem. Uh, and, and so there's just no use setting up because it doesn't take much of a scene issue before you, now I could, you know, like I said, if it's windy, I, could, I just switch to a shorter focal length scope and it's fine then. It's amazing the difference between imaging like a 400 millimeter and a 2800 millimeter. Oh, yeah. Now, if uh, do you get any turbulence from the wind coming over the top of the screen and curling around right over your scope? Well, I, I, that's a that's another great question. I used to set up uh, on the on the other side of my house when it was windy, and I became convinced that that curling that turbulence over the roof was causing the problem. Of course, I can't see any of this. I, I don't think it's a problem coming over the screen, though. But that's just, I, I don't really know that. Uh, there's another. Larry just uh, said, have you ever considered this leaving leaving everything out, putting a nice cover on it and protect uh, it and not having to set up? Yeah, I've, I've looked at that many times. I know some of you do that and, uh, you know, keep... Uh, something underneath to take the humidity out or something like that. I think if I lived in a drier location, I might do that, but it is just, I, I, I can't describe the, you know, you get in the almost every morning, especially in this time of year, there's water all over everything. It's just dripping wet. So, um, I mean, obviously I could, I could put something over and protect it, but I do think I need to keep it uncovered for the day just to let the equipment dry out. So, so I've thought about that and I still may do that. Um, at the very least, I could have a pier out there that I could use. Mm. Uh, so so I, I'm thinking about those things. Okay. Hey, um, I want to go back to the uh, to the windscreen. It's got a it's a mesh. It's not a it's not a solid. Right. Uh, right. The wind, okay. You want and there's more details on your astro bin site. Yeah, yeah, there's all okay. kinds of pictures and, and oh. details. But yeah, it allows a little bit of that air through because otherwise it, it really would be a problem. Yeah. All right. So what you're saying, though, I think is that you can image with that. Or no, the the structure, once you put it up, will survive a 30 mile an hour wind, but you wouldn't put it up if it were any greater than that. But you don't want to image if it's if the wind is coming in at more than eight or 12 miles an hour anyway. Not for these ARP objects, but I do for nebula, for example. Nebula are great. You know, if I'm going to do a, like a planetary nebula, well, planetary nebula are tough because they're so small, but yeah, nebula are great because you can have blurring and stuff and it, it probably just helps the noise. So uh, yeah, it's not a problem then. Okay, thank you. I think we've got most of the yep. suggestions here about uh, from Brian about using an, an on-axis guider and a few other things. And yeah, there's all sorts of stuff in it, but um, they're not questions as such. So, and let's see what else you've got to tell us. Yeah, we haven't even got to the good stuff yet. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the ARP catalog. So these are two images you see at the top that are actually the original ARP images. So as some of you know, uh, these images are inverted mono images. They're not color, they're mono. And they have high brightness and contrast. So he took these with the, the largest telescope in the world at the time. He made the brightness really high. He made the contrast really high. And the reason for that is you can see details really well with these images. He imaged 338 objects. You know, you can ask, well, why 338? I've never seen an explanation for that. He, you know, in my mind, there's thousands of these kinds of objects out there. But I guess those are the ones that he, he assembled in those four years. Interestingly, the width of these objects range from a degree, which is quite a bit, 3,600 arc seconds. You know, the, the full moon is a half a degree. And that's what ARP 317 is that you see here. This is now the object is not a degree wide, but the field here, which because this ARP object is actually these three galaxies, that's a degree wide. So it ranges all the way from 3600 arc seconds all the way down to 15 arc seconds, which is this small galaxy for ARP 60. And this is probably about a half a billion light years away, a small galaxy. And this is the equivalent here of about half of the size of the planet Venus. So these are. These are tough to image because the galaxies don't have much brightness and they're very, very small. Now, the declination range of these objects is plus 87 degrees north, which is almost at the North Pole, all the way down to minus 43 south. So if some of you are out there thinking, hey, I want to image the whole catalog. Well, your imaging location is, has to be between plus 12 north and plus 32 north to capture all of these objects. And that I, the reason I say that is by, by being in that width there from plus that 20 degree latitude width from plus 12 to plus 32, it allows you to have 15 degrees above the horizon 
for the lowest object. And that's still not very much. And for some of you, you still may not be able to do that because you have trees on your horizon or whatever. But the point is that you, you really have to be in a pretty tight range here. And if you live up north where I'm originally from, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, it's going to be a struggle. You, know, you won't be able to do it because you just can't reach down to minus 43 south. So the composition, you know, Alex said a little bit about this in the opening. So there's 11 Messier objects, there's five Caldwell objects, 18 Hickson objects, which are small galaxy clusters. And, uh, and so some of these objects are actually reasonable. And if you're going to start out imaging some of these ARP objects, like, like M51, um, you can do that. You know, these aren't that, some of them aren't that hard. And in fact, when I started on my ARP journey, I thought, man, this is going to be fun. This is easy. And then I stopped because I got the things like I showed you here, ARP-60, which is half the size of Venus, and that seemed impossible. And then I started again and I stopped, and then I started again and stopped. And then I finally felt I had the confidence, you know, processing imaging to be able to get these small, difficult, dim objects. Um, and interestingly, there are some ARP objects that are within one degree of each other. There's 23 pairs, there's two triplets, and there's actually one quadruplet where you have four ARPs within one degree of sky. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be critical of, of Dr. Arp because I think the world of him, but I think in some of these cases, he was just grabbing things off the, uh, off, the, off the film there because he had already captured them. Because frankly, some of these uh, Arp objects that are next to each other aren't the most spectacular Arp objects in the world, but he probably took a picture of one, saw another on the scan there and said, hey, there's another one. Uh, but I don't know that. I, I could be wrong about that. And I know some of you are, are wondering, well, four Arp objects within one, one degree, what does that look like? So this is this is the shot of where we have four ARP objects within one degree. And this is, uh, I can't actually remember what Abel uh, galaxy cluster, this is, an, this is actually a, a huge galaxy cluster. And you can see a lot of other interesting galaxies here as well. But Dr. Arp picked uh, this pair, this triplet here, this pair, and this pair as the actual ARP objects, but not some of these other ones that you see there. So it is sometimes interesting why he picked some and not, not the others. Um, so we're going to talk about each of these are category, uh, categories really quickly. So um, there's actually five categories in the atlas. Uh, the first category is spiral galaxies, which are 101 objects. So for example, this ARP5 here, this falls into the low brightness galaxy category. And you can see all the interesting uh, uh, category names that he has uh, within, well, I should say subcategory names within this category. Now you see down here, the last four are all companion objects. And so, you know, if you, if you add all of that up, that's about 65 companion objects. And my observation is probably half of those are not true companions. They're just galaxies that were visually next to each other. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the second category is elliptical galaxies, and there's 44 of these objects. And this shows you one here, ARP 105, which is the elliptical galaxy connected to the spiral galaxy. You can see the elliptical here, the spiral, and then this long, cool star stream. I love these long star streams. And then you have the this big category called amorphous galaxy. Our, Dr. Arp didn't actually call it amorphous. He just called it galaxies. But it's basically things that didn't fit in either a spiral or elliptical. For example, here's one, Arp 219, that's in this category called galaxies with adjacent loops. And if you look at some of these names, I think this is fascinating. It's a, it's a snapshot in time of where we were in the astronomy field. And so you can see some of these like material ejected from the nuclei. I just think that's so cool. Um, you know, an appearance of fission and irregular clumps. So, uh, yeah, it's just fun to look back on some of that. And then finally, this, this fourth category, double and multiple galaxies. So this is our 330, which is chain. There's some chains in here. Double galaxies, galaxies with wind effects. And then finally, uh, the last category is a kind of a catch-all. It's called miscellaneous. And there's six objects here, which includes M M82. So those are the, the five categories of, of objects. So now we're going to switch gears now that we've had a brief overview of ARP objects, and we're going to look at some of the images that I took and then compare some of these images back to uh, the ARP images. So each of the 338 ARP objects that I've captured is, is uploaded individually on Astrobin, and each of those listings has a technical card which has all the equipment that I use to image the object. It has the dates, it has the filters, it has the gains, the times, the temperatures, the binning, 
the moon phase, the, the integration time, and all of that. Now you can see this one here, which is the antenna galaxies I image for 24 hours. That's an unusual one. You guys know me. Most of you guys know me well enough to know that I don't usually image things for 24 hours, but you know, the antenna galaxies, that was a kind of a special one. So I'm showing all of the listing here. And then, you know, the biggest, not the biggest, but a big piece of work is the description. So I try to try to research and write a detailed description because some of these objects just really have very little written about them. And it's always fun if you're looking at something to read up on something. And then for each of these, I have an image uploaded of the object, of course, and then a comparison of the object to ARP's uh, original image. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, now. So these comparisons, um, as I stated a few minutes ago, you know, it just blows me away that in our backyards, we can take images that we can now compare, you know, somewhat favorably to uh, images that were taken 50 years ago with the largest telescope in the world on top of a mountain. So it kind of blows, blows me away that we're able to do that. So if you look, I'm trying to look at this somewhat, you know, objectively, I think, you know, there's some of these images, you'll see the, there's plenty of advantages to what Dr. Arp was doing here with his process using film to capture these. And typically they were 30 second to one minute exposures. He didn't have the advantage of stacking. He didn't really have the advantage of, they did some processing, which is really interesting. I don't understand some of the film processing techniques that he used to bring out the contrast levels. But one advantage ARP has is definitely in the faint detail. So if you compare his image of ARP4 to the right here, you can see all of these, I mean, with my cursor, hopefully you can see that a lot of these fine details of this galaxy showing up. Whereas in mine, they're very hard to see. And it's, it's very, mine is kind of a, a dim version of this. So certainly when it comes to faint details, Dr. ARP has an advantage. Now, if I just took my loom of the left slide here, just the loom, and stretched it tremendously, it wouldn't look that much different than, than Dr. Arps, but I, I'm trying to come up with images here, color images that, that are also what I consider to be pretty pictures. Because what you'll see in Arps image, when he, when he does the kind of film development techniques he used, you can see a lot of noise in that, and that just doesn't appeal to me. The other thing you can look at, you look at the small galaxy next door, and this will be characteristic of Dr. Arp's images, uh, the, the brighter issues are blown out. And so for that, you can actually, in my image, I think shows it better on the left. But certainly for the faint details of the main galaxy, you don't see that as well. And here's another example. I love these long star streams. This one's a couple hundred thousand light years long. And Dr. Arp's image, you can clearly see that star stream that goes between these two spiral galaxies makes sense to the left. Whereas on mine, you know, it's, it's hard to see that. So certainly, you know, you have to give give one win to Dr. Arp there because he's the faint details are, are better in his side. So from my perspective, though, you know, having color is just the godsend for us. You know, color, <laughs> I didn't appreciate how much color adds to an image until you start comparing to hundreds of black and white images. So, for example, here, Arp 337, Dr. Arp's image is fantastic. You look at it and you see all of the detail and really looks nice. But you don't really appreciate what parts of that are the galaxy, what parts are the dust, what parts are the emissions. So I'm hoping, you know, coming through on your screen there, you can see that the color really adds to our ability to interpret this image. Um, here's another example, not nearly as dramatic. This is ARP 268, where if you look at ARP's view, you can see a lot of the detail. You can see more detail than mine. But if you look at mine, you see a lot of these fascinating emission areas, which are these bubbles of pink hydrogen and inside of that you can see uh, some purple and throughout here you see blue star clusters and so the color of not only the stars because i love stars but the the, the objects themselves uh, sometimes the colors really really pay off another uh, these are just another one i'm gonna go through this quickly arp 82 again you know I, I do like the colors of the stars and how that adds to the image but also some of the the, the, uh, the H2 regions of the galaxy, the yellow core, the blue star clusters, uh, you just get a better feel of the nature of the galaxy uh, from uh, a color image. And then here's, here's another one. And, and again, you know, the yellow core, some of the blue star cloud areas or clusters, um, I just really enjoy uh, being able to see that color. Another aspect is the bright detail. So if you look at ARP 77, the central area of the galaxy on the right, you can see, uh, is a big white core area that looks like, you know, kind of any galaxy that you would blow up to that extent. But when you actually look at what that core is truly, it's, a, it's what the scientists call a nuclear core. So there's a tremendous amount of star formation occurring in the core of that galaxy. And you can see the, 
the dust and the, the core itself and then the surrounding region of stars that are just blowing up around it. So the bright details are sometimes blown out in the ARP images, whereas we with our telescopes and equipment today can really capture some of the detail of those uh, inner cores. Here's another example, whereas ARP image on the right, it kind of blows out a lot of the central galaxy, but you can see there's a lot of nice uh, star formation, that's blue star formation that's occurring here. You got basically a white core and then blue clouds and clusters around that. And so you can't see that as well in the ARP image. And then we're gonna compare um, a little bit to the Hubble, which is, a, is, is in a way it's kind of an embarrassing <laughs> comparison and humiliating, I guess would be the word. But um, it is interesting to see, you know, on the ARP image, you have uh, this here, which you see some detail, but it's, you know, it's all white. Whereas um, when I developed this, before I saw the Hubble image, I, I wasn't sure if this was an artifact or not, because I was getting these orange dust bands and that blue, and it just looks so bizarre to me. But then if you look at the Hubble, you know, that's about kind of what it looks like. So um, uh, the Hubble's always going to blow you away with the resolution. And the Hubble's always going to win this contest, but it is. I think it's useful to do the comparisons because when I do this comparison, I can see things in my image after look at the Hubble's because the Hubble image helps helps bring them out. Here's another example of the Hubble image where you can see uh, on the left the ARP image, and then especially, especially this galaxy here, you can see my image has a little bit more detail there, and of course the Hubble is fantastic there for that. Um, a couple of other comparisons I think you might find interesting. One is that in 50 years of time, between when Dr. R took his image and when, when I took these images, stars have moved. And I know that's a bit of a, a shocker sometimes because we like the stars. To, they seem like they're always in the same place when I look at them in the sky. But so when I aligned these comparison images, I started noticing that, you know, generally the stars in the same place. But like here, you got this orange star that's moved. You know, it seems like it's moved a lot. And so uh, I did, I don't know if there was this one or another one, I did do some verification that you know, these stars are actually moving this amount. So to have this many arc seconds of movement in those 50 years actually made some sense. Uh, you don't see this very much though. It's not like a lot of stars, you know, it doesn't happen to a lot of stars, but you know, I found that fascinating. I talked about this a bit earlier in something I call dubious companions. So you'll see many, many companions in the arc catalog that are called companions. And if you read the verbiage in the text, it sounds like the implication is that they're next to each other, but they're really not. And and uh, first of all, the first indication of that is looking at redshift, and redshift shows that there are different differences. Now, as soon as I say that in the back of my mind, I've got Dr. Arp speaking to me and saying, Gary, I don't believe in the redshift. The redshift's not a function of distance. So that's okay. Let's put that aside for a second, and let's just talk about what we know about galaxies, you know, things like size and disturbance. So you look at, for example, this one on the left here, you've got this large galaxy, which is uh, typically in my experience, these kinds of structures indicate galaxies that are on the order of say 90,000 to 150,000 light years. So this is a, a, a fairly you know, Milky Way sized galaxy. And then you've got this one here, which is very bright and well-defined as well. But if you believe that this is 120,000 years then this thing's only 30,000 years, let's say. And, and that makes no sense. I see no galaxies with this much defined structure that are only 30,000 uh, light years in diameter. I'm not a scientist. I'm not saying that that's always the case. I'm just saying in my experience, that's just generally not the case. And the same with this one over here, you can see two galaxies, ARP-127, that are fairly well-defined in structure. Uh, my guess is they're probably similar sizes. Um, so I just don't think I don't think they could be next to each other here because that would mean this other yellow galaxy would be, which would be so small. So size is one aspect. The other aspect is disturbance. So when two galaxies are next to each other, typically you're going to see if they're within a few million light years, some disturbance. And so, you know, clearly none of these, to my opinion, have disturbance. So here you've got these two huge galaxies. In my opinion, it's pretty obvious one's in front of the other. Um, and same with this one over on the right. So I think, it's not a big deal, you know, but it's just interesting that, that a lot of these uh, companions are, are not, in my opinion, just probably not companions. You know, it's just, in, in, I just find that interesting. And then finally, there's this odd structure category that I find uh, interesting as well. So on the right, ARP-198 is a galaxy that he used as part of his, uh, his assumption here that galaxies are ejecting material. So this was a jet that was being ejected from this galaxy. Now, when you do it in color, you can pretty clearly see, I mean, maybe it is a jet. We can't really say it's not, but to me, it looks like you got a blue face on spiral and you got a yellow edge on galaxy in front of it. So 
Yeah. Could be a jet, but I think it's probably just two superimposed galaxies. And then you've got stuff like this. So this is ARP-192. And really weird two galaxies that are merging. You've got this weird spike coming out to the upper right. But then when I got my picture back, no spike. What's going on here? Uh, so I looked at, at some papers. It turns out about 20 years after I published this, because this was a, a, another proof of the material being ejected out of the, the nucleus. And uh, fascinating enough, it turns out this is, uh, some scientists went back on the records, looked back to the time, exact date he took this picture, and found that there was, uh, um, at, at, at this time, uh, there was a comet, uh, not a comet, it was uh, a meteorite, uh, a meteor. An asteroid? Asteroid, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Molly. Asteroid uh, in this exact same spot. And, 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 you know, a good learning from this is that things that seem like they could never be that much of a coincidence, like an asteroid that starts at the core of a galaxy and moves out just at the time you're taking that picture, those things happen. And so uh, they did confirm that this was an asteroid. Uh, and, and thanks, Molly, for, for helping me out there. Um, and finally, this is my last section. I just want to talk uh, a little bit about kind of digging deeper into this whole categorization thing that I love that ARP did. In other words, putting galaxies of similar forms together to see what we can learn from that. So I'm going to show you a few things that I've thrown together. They're not all these, just ARP objects. They're because the ARP objects are peculiar, but there's plenty of peculiar galaxies in the sky. So this is showing, for example, uh, a series of galaxies that are similar to the antenna. So I'm, upper upper left here is the famous antenna galaxy, ARP 244, which all of us know. Uh, and at the time I looked at that, I thought, man, that's a bizarre, unique galaxy. But, you know, if you look around, there's just lots of galaxies that look like that. It's not just one. And so some of these are ARP objects, others aren't. Um, but pretty clearly, these are two galaxies that are in the process of merging. And with the way they approach each other, their tails become elongated. And it's just, to me, a fascinating to see, you know, more than just one object of this type. And you can see the criteria that I've used to assemble these, but I just picked the 12 that I like. There's, there's more than 12 out there for sure. And in a similar way, this is something that I just labeled as late stage mergers. So these are uh, typically galaxies where scientists have been able to identify two cores, but they've merged to the point where there's really no clear sign of any individual structure in there. What stands out to me in each of these is really the superb the dust lanes and how the dust lanes really stand out and the star stream. So now you no longer have these long star streams extending out from the galaxies, but they they started to kind of fade out and, and be wrapped in the galaxies. And so, you know, I just find it fascinating to be looking at these common common forms like this. And then you can do something like this, which is, you know, I just put these into different stages. So this so the one we just looked at, you know, which is the late stage is this column B, which is I call coalesced galaxies. And then the one I looked at before that was this stage C and to some extent stage B. So you go from having galaxies that are next, and these are all galaxies of similar size. So you go from galaxies that have these long bridges, these star stream bridges that I love, to galaxies that have these short bridges, to then galaxies where the cores are actually touching to then galaxies where the cores are intermingled, you can't even distinguish between them. Now, what's fascinating about this to me is that I look at this in sequence from left to right. So you've got these two galaxies approaching. Now, maybe these two galaxies in this left column will never reach the right side, but to me, I can visualize how galaxies would proceed from left to right, whereas Dr. Arp would insist that these galaxies actually go from right to left. So they start out as one common form, they become ejected and they separate. And, and so it's just a different way at looking at how galaxies um, are formed and proceed. A couple more to close. Uh, one thing that fascinates me is, is galaxy loops. And so at first, you know, these seem sort of random, but then as you look at them, and especially as you look back to these antenna types and you see how these tails are, so these loops are when you have uh, a galaxy where another galaxy comes close and that tail ends up wrapping around. And the simulations, and, and many scientists now have done these simulations with approaching galaxies, uh, show how these loops are formed beautifully. And so it's just, it's fun to see. Now, sometimes you have multiple loops forming. Sometimes like down here, you've got these weird figure eights going on. 
So you can end up with a lot of interesting structures uh, when these galaxies uh, become deformed. There's another category here, which I've called irregular spirals. So I started seeing this trend of galaxies between 25 and 50,000 light years, which they weren't spiral galaxies, but they didn't look like irregular galaxies either. They all had a blue disk with kind of a whitish core and really a poorly defined arm structure. And you could see the star clouds you know, everywhere in the disk. So I just put these on one slide and it's kind of fun to look through there and see some of the, the common aspects of these galaxies. Are these galaxies that are in the process of becoming spirals from irregulars or, or you know, what's exactly going on here? You know, I, I really don't know. And then finally, this is you know, probably my favorite one. I posted another one of these yesterday on Astrobin separate one, but these are collisional rings. And when I first read about these, I thought, no way, there's no way that a galaxy is going to hit another galaxy head on right in the center so that you form this ring of the galaxy that's hit. And then the person that impacts the galaxy, the offender, the culprit is running away. But yeah, no doubt, there's lots of objects that show this. So you've got, you know, typically like this upper left one, you've got this circle that basically this galaxy has impacted. This one is now moving away and left a hole there. And the one I posted yesterday, which is a different galaxy, shows the same thing. Here you've got the same thing where a galaxy is impacted. One leaves a hole. Here you've got the same thing. And there's some subtle differences between these. But clearly, this idea of these rings forming uh, in the way scientists believe they do, which is through these collisions along the polar axis, um, I think that's the right way to think of them. So this is my last slide. I've just put all the images, um, 338 ARP, ARP images that I've captured over the last five years on one slide. Uh, originally, I thought maybe I'd make a poster of it, but they're just too small. <laughs> unless, unless I blew it up wall size, uh, then I could maybe uh, do that. So um, that concludes my presentation. And uh, Alex, Eric, Tim, if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to take those. Now, I have a question that's kind of been brewing watching your your presentation. You're really quiet, Eric. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll try to speak up. Oh, I have my mic flipped up. My my fault. So, did ARP actually dispute redshift in general? Well, some some people on the call probably know better than I, but I, I think the answer is yes. So we're talking about redshift of rotation, say in in M. In M31? Well, really... he, he's, he's talking specifically about kind of distant galaxies and quasars in particular. So quasars, where we look at the redshift and we think those are billions of light years away, he looks at quasars because these quasars would oftentimes occur in pairs on each side of a galaxy. And his theory was, the, was that these quasars were ejected by the galaxy and that the redshift over time would become more like, a, like initially the redshift Supposedly, you know, because of the the, the low redshift, it, in, the, the, it indicates that it's a distant galaxy. But he thought it was more a function of age. So as these gal as these quasars would age, they'd become uh, more like a typical redshift. So so I, I think there's parts of that redshift theory that that he definitely disputed, and maybe maybe parts you know like M31, maybe he was okay with that. I don't know. Well, I think uh, Eric, you're talking about Doppler shift as opposed to um, to the redshift. That's the result of the expansion of the universe. Well, actually, they're not unrelated. Well, they're yeah, not. But um, cos but the, the, cosmological the cosmological redshift is like where space is stretching the wavelength well, right. as opposed to the wavelength being stretched by moving away from you. Yeah, that's right. More space is being created, but still it's the same idea. It's moving away from you versus um, moving towards you. Anyway, without arguing that, uh, it, it seems odd that he could maintain that position uh, through 1998. Well, he maintained it till the, the day he died in 2013. And there's quite a few people that still believe all of what he put together. So, yeah. Remember John Dobson's theory of, of the world. And uh, he was still he was still professing that. And remember how the how the um, the Big Bang Theory got named in the first place uh, by somebody ridiculing the Big Bang Theory. Um, so uh, there are a lot of people that that, that, that there are controversies and yeah this is a strange one speaking of controversies have you ever tried an uh, an on axis guider uh, huh. gary i've looked i've looked into it yeah and in fact some people i, I can't remember the name now but i think there's people on astrobin that have been posted images with some on axis guiding no I, I i'm intrigued by it though 
Yeah, it, uh, we've had several shows with um, um, Gaston coming on and explaining the concepts behind it and stuff like that. And there's a lot of information about it. Uh, and it does work for a lot, a lot of people. They really yeah. like the idea. And as somebody here at ERA or somebody, ERA, yeah, anything to help the man get more sleep because <laughs> it maintains, it, it actually constantly is watching uh, what the star looks like and, and adjusting focuses for it. And um, Black Tie Photography has a question about uh, uh, exposure time for Dr. Arps. How long were Dr. Arps' exposures? And that reminded me, just how long are you taking each of your pictures? So Yeah, so Dr. Arp, and again, you know, maybe people on, on the call here that know more than I do, because I've actually tried to research this, and it's that's a hard piece of information to get. From what I can tell, they're mostly between 30 seconds and one minute of exposure. And what's interesting to me is how he processed these in a specific way, film processing, to bring out a lot of those details. And I've tried to understand kind of the emulsion process or whatever he was using there, but it's really complicated. So just like we have our details of how we process these images, I think at the time using film, they had the same sort of complexity in trying to bring out a lot of these details. But the answer is, is somewhere between 30 seconds and a minute. Now I'm imaging mine for two minutes at a time. And, uh, and like I said, I typically like for my looms, I want to get two hours of two minutes. So I could, you know, I could, I'm not sure if it makes that much difference if I would, you know, it's, it's just simply if I go longer than two minutes, I worry that if, you know, for all the subs I lose due to whatever, you know, clouds, airlines, uh, somebody bumping the scope, uh, I hate to throw out, you know, a five or 10 minutes. So two minutes just seemed like a good compromise to me. And, and looking at, if you actually look at, some people have put together tables for these cameras that show kind of the optimum exposure time for your sky darkness. And for me, two minutes was about the right depth. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say something about the ARP catalog. For those of you who are going to go out and image the ARP catalog and you go to Sequence Generator Pro and type in ARP 126 or whatever you do, or they're not necessarily called ARP objects. The ARP catalog is a collection made by ARP of images that already had other names. And so what you need is something that translates the ARP number into the NGC or UGC or something else like that number. And when he calls them peculiar galaxies, they're often pairs and groups of galaxies and things like that. And they may have two, two or three different UGC numbers. And uh, so uh, really it's, it's fun to do. I, I, um, I was getting frustrated with my new lens on my, um, that I was playing with. And I decided I'm not gonna waste any more time out here in this beautiful dark desert trying to get this lens to work so uh and i and i was also frustrated with my visual observing looking for arp objects because they are extremely hard to find most of them are very hard to find visually even in my 15 inch dog in the dark desert last night and at other places i've tried but uh, i decided you know what i'm going to do i'm just going to tell sequence generator pro to go take a number of these arp objects and it did it you know i, I said go take uh, 12 five minute exposures in luminance and uh, just go plate solve and go find it and stuff like that but i had to use the ngc numbers to find them and in order to do that i had to translate them across and yeah you can actually see these little specks of galaxies when you're doing that stuff and they're very small even at my 2450 millimeter focal length so yeah so um, just to comment on that for many of these objects they will never show up in a sky atlas program so what I've learned to do, and it actually works quite well, at least for my system, is simply to type in the coordinates. So my any, I, hopefully any Sky Atlas program will let you type in the Latin longitude. So if you've got, no matter what, I don't even search by object name anymore because so many of them are either incorrect or they just don't show up. But and the I, locations are sometimes incorrect also. That's true. The, yeah, and the various catalogs. The, you can find this catalog, uh, go to the Astronomical League, under one of their observing programs, it's called the ARP Peculiar Galaxies. And by the way, it's one of the programs in the Astronomical League that you can get your merit badge by photographically, doing it photographically. I don't know what all that means because I'm old school and I've always, I always think of um, the uh, ARP 
or of the Astronomical League clubs as a visual thing, and I have to, to star hop to them and stuff like that. But it ain't necessarily so for some of the clubs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions that we need to address there? I think we're all set, but there's lots of commentary on your presentation, and I think you probably stimulated a few people to start looking at these ARP, ARP objects. Yeah, I would say if, if anybody has any questions, um, for those of you that are on AstroBin, and I think a lot of you are, just don't be afraid to send me a private message and ask, ask me a question about it, because it's a, it's a tough road. It's a really tough road. And they would do that by going to your AstroBin page and looking up there, right? Yeah, at the top of the page, you can click on one of those menus. It says send private message, and, and I'm happy to help out that way. Okay. Well, I think that then is close to doing it for the night. I mean, you've got a lot of good comments over there. A lot of people were interested in the presentation. You were running 80, 90 people through most of the show, and that's that's a pretty good night for us. Um, I, I want you all to come on back next week. Um, Larry uh, did a lot of work. Tim did a lot of work getting you the videos all prepared for uh, showing you yeah, I think five, six different astro imaging rigs. Um, and it's fun to sit around and shoot the breeze with a bunch of people at a star party. And we'll talk about star parties and all that kind of stuff. But all that is next week. So come on back and we'll see you. Hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And uh, keep yourself safe and go out and find a comet if you can. Okay? Bye, everybody. Tim, you're in charge. Take us out. <laughs> <laughs>